said to her, what in God's name are you doing? She said, it's all foolishness. And she said, I'm not going to let this get me down. And she didn't. And she walked. Now she walked with a limp, but she walked. My youngest son said to me the other day, he's got terrible knees. This is a medical fact. The doctor said to him, your knees look like hamburger. It's a weightlifter. He's been very athletic all of his life and he's got Joe Namath's knees. I said to him the other day, why aren't you doing what the doctor said? He told you to alternate hot and cold, stretch your knees out, do all these. And he said, no. And I said, what do you mean no? He said, because if I start doing that, my knees are going to take into consideration that they are sick. And there is no way I'm going to let my mind know that. Thereby, he says, I walk fine, I have any problems. How he ever came upon that at 22, I don't know. I think I came upon that in my 40s somewhere. The more you the more you acknowledge it, the more real it becomes. And then, this is before I really realized it, set up three people, and I did this once when I was teaching over presentation high school. Never realizing what we were doing, but I was telling the girls at the time at Presentation High School, I was teaching seniors. I was a moderator of the sophomore class and teaching seniors. And I remember saying to them, mind over matter, okay? And I said, now this is how it works. When Sister Joan comes through the hall tomorrow morning, we're going to be strategically stationed at certain places. And as she walks by us, we're going to say, do you feel all right? <laughs> huh. Oh, I've never been sorry she was a bitch. I'm glad to this day. I've never had remorse and I'll suffer for it in another life, but I have been sorry. So, first girl, she came down the hall. First girl approached her and said, Sister Joan, did you get any sleep last night? Sister said, I don't know why. The girl said, oh, I don't know, Sister, you just look so tired. Got to the next girl further down the hall, and the girl said, Sister, are you sick? Sister said, I don't think so. But I don't think I slept good last night. <laughs> got to me, and I said, Sister, are you all right? You're so pale. She got to her room and went down, back down the hall and checked out for the day. <laughs> we programmed her right into it. Then having total guilt, waited a day, you know as I say a day, <laughs> called up and told her what we did. <laughs> and haven't you hated it when you feel like right somebody says, God, you look tired. I want to just kill them. And why wouldn't you? You know, you've been working for 16 hours a day, of course you're supposed to. God, tired. People come, I don't know whether they think that's a nice thing to say or a kind thing to say. They're always saying these wonderful things. Do you feel all right? Yeah, why? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Which leaves you thinking, what? If I turn green, do I? <laughs> yes. Now, how would you categorize a problem that maybe has carried over from other lives? My youngest son who has problems with his right leg, and you said other lifetimes, he always had problems with that leg. Yes. What I would do is I would face that problem with him, whether he believes it or not. Whether it's in his sleep or when he's relaxed or when he, whether you just want to face it dead on. And say to him, listen to me. You've had your leg cut off, amputated, you've had it hurt, you've had it burned. In previous times, do not carry the same problem over. Now, I don't care whether he goes... <coughs> Because if you speak the truth to that mind, and the subconscious accepts it to be truth, which it is, the problem goes away. Absolutely. I've had people with the most horrendous things, and especially a young person. Do you see what I mean? Because they'll just carry things right away. And that's why a lot of people in younger years will be a lot more fragile health. You've heard pe people like that, God, when I was younger, I was sickly all the time. It's because they've been so fresh from the life which your son was, and carried something over immediately. 
And the younger the child is, easier it is. Like the story I always tell, which was so marvelous, of a little kid who came in, his mother brought him in, his last to Shefford, he had leukemia. And I grabbed that little kid and I said to him, listen to me, you died of blood poisoning in your past life. Do you understand any big eyes? Did I? What difference does it make? I said, you're not going to do this again, you're not going to check out, you're not going to poison your blood. He went into total remission. And I heard from the woman, the kid is a grown man now. Never went into it again. And the younger they are, and the more adamant you are, the more believing they are of you. The more firm you are, the subconscious says, by God, that's the truth, and I'm going to release it. Because, of course, blood poisoning would be, do you see what I mean? Would be interpreted to the body, we got to do something to poison your blood, thereby leukemia. And our bodies tell us things. Like I tell the story of getting blood poisoning in my own foot, and I thought, what's that from? And I sat down on the couch and somebody said, in my mind, because I hear Francine corroding me, but this is actually within my own soul said, because you're running too fast. And I was. I was running everywhere. I mean, I didn't walk. I ran. I jumped. I, I was frantic. And I thought, well, the body said, you won't slow down, we'll fix you. And it was so stupid. It was on my stone steps running up to my house, brick steps, barely, barely broke the skin, but there was moss on the steps. And any other time I could have cut it, fallen, broke, what, nothing, you're over with it. But at that point, and your body will tell you. Yes? Well, you mentioned that when we have negative thoughts, we should neutralize them. So, how do we do that? Neutralizing takes a form, it's a good question, in many ways. In other words, take for instance that I, I give you a prime example, and I don't want to tell you too much personally about my life because it's not what you hear, but I can only tell you personally because I'm not going to tell you about every secret thing that goes on in the reading room, even though you don't know these people. But I've been mad at my oldest son for a couple of reasons, okay? And I let it sit, I let it sit. And that's not like me. So today I went downstairs, he works downstairs, went into his office and said, come here, I want to see you, and just let him have it. So you just express what's on your mind and just get it out and forget it. Yeah, and if I can't do that, if I can't get a hold of the person, because it's usually always, I'm telling you right now, please listen to me, it's always a person. We may surround it in all the other butter that we can get around it, but it's always a person. You can't get to the person then neutralize it by saying to yourself, there's nothing I can do to affect a change in it. I'm not going to make myself sick with this. Who will know in a hundred years from now anyway? What difference does it make? I'll put my energy into something else. You see what I'm saying? How good does it do if I'm anxious about it? Won't things happen anyway? I mean, you've got to literally deprogram that. Yes? Oh yeah, and most of the time, it's all our perception of things, isn't it? If that were not true, three or four of us standing around, seeing an argument or something happened, two of us out of the four say, oh, it's not so bad, and the other two are just up in arms and ready to walk out. It's always how we perceive things, do you see what I mean? And, be and because of our different themes, that's what affects it. Do you see what I mean? In other words, let's say that she and I have a justice theme, and somebody does something. We're going to be right up to the ceiling, and maybe you two say, oh, shh, it's all right. She and I have got to get the justice thing out and go praying around, and the other two say, oh, forget it. But that's their way of neutralizing it. But you know in yourself, and the thing is to know yourself. Do you see what I'm saying? It's what is the best effectual way for me. My effectual way is that you'll hear from me that I won't keep it in. Now, I can lie in the bush for you for a long time, but you're going to get it. <laughs> and as I'm lying in the bush, I'm thinking of how I'm going to get you. But isn't that making it more negative all the time? Oh, no, because it's put into activation. It's not yes. growing all the time. Oh, no, no, no. See, growing is not bad as long as it's not held in. See, the thing that causes cancer is it grows and you never let it out. It grows and it festers. That's no different, pardon how gross this is, than to let a boil come to the head and let it go out, okay? Than to try to lance it prematurely. 
We want to know when to do that. Like saying to your husband, if you scratch on that leather again when you're driving, I'm going to cut your hand off. And my husband, when he's driving, has this thing that he does. That, you know, where the, uh, the gear shift thing is in the middle. Okay, as he's driving, he rubs that leather. <laughs> and I said to myself, this is how I start with myself. He's probably stressed. He's worried about a lot of things. And... So it's just somebody rubbing leather, all right? Now I will put my mind somewhere else and not be concerned about the fact that he's rubbing that leather. But my mind goes back to it, he's still rubbing that leather. And we're on a long ride. Now I have either one or two choices. I can let him rub the leather and be nice and kind and sweet, and by the time I get there, I am in a full boil. And then he does the wrong thing, I'm right at his throat, and he has no idea what, I, what he's done. <laughs> or I could say, if you don't quit making that noise, I'm going to cut your hand off. Clear up to where your neck begins. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wonderful catharsis. It's last night, everybody was there. My son was bugging me all evening long. Bugged me, bugged me, drove me crazy. Right? Yeah. He, see, Ben was there. <laughs> Six foot five, weighs 240 pounds. We were sitting in carols. And I had this glass of water, ice. <laughs> and I looked over at him and he's, and he's 22. But the boys are like that. You know, you have boys, they want to pinch your poke in and all this. And I said, well, I won't tell you what word I used. But anyway, I said, <laughs> and so now, cool, and I poured the whole thing on. Well, his face just went. <laughs> you don't know what that did. It took off 10 years off my life. Because <laughs> I can't hit him, it doesn't hurt him. I've tried, he's like steel. What am I going to do? Reap and jump up and punch this kid? It's too big. But the water, with the ice, in his crotch, <laughs> brought him to. <laughs> and that's wonderful. But see, people say, oh, I wouldn't have done that because that's embarrassing. Look, he's all wet. And, da -da 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 -da. and yet you carry it around and it festers and it boils and everything. Why can't we say to someone, shut up? You know, shut up is a wonderful word, really. We say it through. No, it means shut up. Shut everything up. Shut it down. Shut it up. Shut it off. <laughs> and then, you see, we think we're being so saintly, but we're not because it goes out in other areas. We get sick and then other people have to take care of us and we're a mess and we're cranky and we're mean and they pay for it anyway. And we're paying for it and they pay for it. Yeah, of course they are. So we've been nice and saintly all our life and never argue with our husband. We get sick and malingering and he has to take care of us. So there. We've gotten his back in the worst way we possibly can. And then you hear people say, well, no, I'm not taking so much. I'm so mean. Why? Why didn't you let it out? Why can't you stand up so you make somebody mad? It's a lot more in the old adage of there's a lot more room on the outside than there is inside. Oh, yeah, but I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. No, but you can walk around and bubble up, can't you? And nobody ever escapes that, because then you go out and beat the dog. Or haven't you ever worked all day and go home and take it out of your kids? I have. And you find yourself in this fishwife mode, and it's really somebody else at work that you should have given it to, and the poor little kid's standing there going, huh? It's misguided energy that goes inside and makes us sick. And you have got to deprogram that. You have got to learn what channel to put it into. And when you can't do that, much like what she was asking me, you neutralize it, you start asking yourself, well, I can't do anything about it, that's an impotent thing, I'll work it out, I'll go in the garden, I'll run around, whatever. I'll do something productive. But so many times those are rare, and so many times it's actually a person, yes, but I'll hurt their feelings, I'll do this, I'll do that. And they won't like me. What's worse, you not liking you, and like she said, rejecting yourself. And then we don't like ourselves because we're a wimp. And we're all internal. And we're self-conscious. And that doesn't mean you're going to turn cruel or mean. In fact, what happens is you get healthier. 
you get more harmonious, you get more even disposition, you get more stable-minded. And when you deal with people, even through this week, and they start telling you about their aches and pains, as people do, and that's good for them too, because we should ventilate. Ask them who's causing the pain in their neck. Say, who is the pain in your neck? Who is causing your chest problem? Who is causing your stomach problem? You would be amazed at the person. I said this to a woman in my room one day, and she said, my oldest daughter, just like, and then she went, like, how could she possibly have said that the pain in her neck was her daughter? What, you mean to tell me that kids can't cause you a pain in your heart, your back, your head? Or that a spouse, not even meaning to, can. Or mother and father can't. Do not, another thing to do before we take a break, do not identify yourself with another person. My mother had arthritis, thereby I will. Do not do that. You're programming yourself. My sister and brother have weak stomach, and so do I. No, do not do that. Everybody's died of vascular problems in my family, and so will I. No. Tennyson was a marvelous example of that. There were 12 children in Alfred Lord Tennyson's family. Eleven of them went totally insane except for him. Totally and completely insane except for him. And the reason why he didn't was because of his friend Alan who said, don't be ridiculous, come on, let's join the rowing team and quit being so silly and just quit thinking about yourself. And his friend died. And that's why he wrote In Memoriam. But what a testimony to you don't have to be what you're genetically presupposed to be. And he fought the depression all of his life because he knew he had a disposition for it. But he didn't go totally insane. Now that's quite a statistics. 11, 12 children, 11 go crazy. I mean, that's like waiting for the night to fall. I walk like my mother. And now we're telling everybody they had Alzheimer's, and so you will have it too. We've had Alzheimer's with us all through the centuries. Every one of us grew up in a block where old Mrs. Van Dyke or whoever it was was up the street and wandered off and acted goofy. It was just the thing in the neighborhood. We had old Mrs. Van Dyke, you probably had somebody. All of a sudden we make a big thing out of it. Did you ever notice that when Jaws came out, how many shark fights you heard of? Everybody was getting tanked by sharks. You hear, any, uh, hear anything about shark bites anymore? No. The minute the world starts focusing on something, all of a sudden it's running rampant, isn't it? We didn't even know what the word was a few years back. But let the press, the media, the world start looking at everything, and you don't tell me that negative programming doesn't add to negative programming. It builds and it creates its own tulpa. And tulpa means it creates its own creation unto itself. Have you ever gotten afraid or panicky or even years ago watching a doctor's show and the more you watch it, you've got every symptom? <laughs> you know, if you're shaking your head no, then you're an android because mostly everyone has had a show or a picture or heard of a friend and you think, oh my God, I've got that. And I've had that too. Oh yeah. Oh, you bet we're doing it with AIDS. <coughs> you can't believe when AIDS first hit and they said about night sweats, every change of life woman had me on the phone. <laughs> oh, and we're so panicky. Like I went up to see my friend who's dying of AIDS. People are afraid. It's just ter terrible. They're afraid to come near, near him. They're afraid that if he sweats or cries or whatever, they're going to get it. It's so crazy. See, we're so ignorant. We're so ignorant. And then people build on it and build on it and build on it. And now they're talking about that 90% of people who've been diagnosed with AIDS, they're convinced, don't even have AIDS. And that's scary. See, I can even remember, and I'm sure most of you are old enough to remember, we've always had AIDS with us. That was what the boy in the bus was all about. Do you remember that years ago, the boy in the bubble? And then we know that animals get it. That's why Pargo was developed. 
the, the exact same thing that happens to the human happens to the animals, except we vaccinate animals. But you ask a veterinarian, why do we give a large animal parvo? You know what he say to you? Because his immune system breaks down and he will die of everything. And then you say to him, isn't that AIDS? And they say, well, it's an animal AIDS. What are we? I said to a doctor, just in the mere chance that this might work, why don't you listen to this reasoning? Why don't you take a group of volunteers who have AIDS and inject them with parvo? Do you know what he said? They may die. <laughs> Why don't you, I said to the doctor, give the patient as much morphine or whatever they want when they're dying of cancer? You know what he said to me? They may become addicted. What, on the other side, they're going to be shooting up? <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious when I tell you this. If you have never had this experience, it's absolutely the God's truth. You ask the doctor and he'll tell you. <coughs> Why can't I give the patient as much morphine as they want? Because they'll kill themselves or they'll become addicted. What? And they're dying of cancer. They're dying of AIDS. Listen, there's no way out of AIDS. What? You're going to take the chance you don't give them the vaccination because they're going to die? Well, thank God because we knew they were going to recover. Yes? What was the point in the Surgeon General making that statement about there not being ever being a cure for AIDS? I couldn't believe that. Negativity. negativity and if we really want to go through the programming we're not supposed to stay in a room of smoke we're not supposed to drink water we don't use hair dye we don't uh, eat in aluminum pans I mean we don't eat hamburger I, on and on it goes every we don't do anything just walk around we should be like the boy in the bubble walk around in a bubble I say like the Greeks everything in moderation and if you keep everything in moderation, you'll never do go. You'll never swing your pendulum too far. The only one thing that I have a problem with is drugs, because drugs do change the chemistry of the body more so than anything else does. Alcohol isn't too sharp or swift with it, but drugs more than anything else in this world. Oh, it fries the brain. It fries the brain, and then what, what do you have? And when you fry the brain and you have no cellular structure there, you can't fight anything. Oh yeah, I heard that same thing too, Linda, about the Surgeon General. What a negative thing. Imagine if we had that kind of PR back in the 16th century when the plague hit. And then it said, we will never cure the plague. We would have said that plague, wouldn't we? I'm sure we would have. And now plague is a thing of the past or cholera or any of those things. See, we think this is the only time in the world that we've been beset by a plague. Oh, no. I think it's a self-cleansing process of the world in general, not just from the gays, for God's sake, because let me tell you something. It started in Africa, and it never started with the gays. It started with sodomizing animals by the heterosexuals. And why in God's name we blame it on them is beyond me. And that's a fact. That is no medical fact. 